I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome to Unashamed. We um, we're back with you. Did that? Did you preach yesterday? I did not. I hadn't preached in probably three weeks, and I'm not up for another week and a two weeks. Well, so. you may forget how to do it by the time you get back up. I might. Well, maybe you I should, might forget. You should preach on Jeremiah 20 and verse nine. Ooh, that's one of my favorites. Mm. Look that up in your spare time. That was our theme Jeremiah. verse. When Jason and I were in school, that was their theme verse for our class. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9. It's very good. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, I'll read it. But if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up mm. in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I, cannot. I love that. Yeah. And Jeremiah had a lot of sermons that fell on deaf ears. <laughs> he, he, he's a, mm. he had a tough group. He had a tough crowd. You know, they say tough crowd. So I did preach yesterday, Zach, and it's interesting because I've been trying to align where we're our preaching series with our podcast series because I'm already studying and I get to listen to y'all, so I get a lot of good sermon material. <laughs> So I'll take anything I can get. It's good prep. It's it is good, good prep. Sermon prep. And so unfortunately, uh, though, now there's like a gap because we're already into Luke. I'm still in Second Peter, you know, which is where we were. Oh, I know. I, I, I'm going to have to confess. When you're up there preaching sometimes, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Didn't I say that? <laughs> that was my idea <laughs> in the podcast. Exactly. Because I, I know we have the amens, which I've always yeah. been a proponent of the well. A lot of the African American churches have the well, which I love, mm-hmm. which means you remember what that means, Phil? When they say, uh, Well, oh yeah. When a preacher oh, yeah. says something, that means yeah, it's like, uh, I disagree. Well, and if you see me after, I will explain what comes after the well. <laughs> they don't interrupt but, you. They're just like well. they're, they're kind and respectful, but there is a, a different interpretation to that line of thought. <laughs> But I don't know what you do when you say podcast material. <laughs> well, unashamed. Yeah. So, so I was uh, I was dealing with, which is probably one of the toughest. And I mean, I'm the one that planned the schedule, so it's not like I didn't know I was going to have to deal with this chapter. But I was in Second Peter chapter two yesterday, which is one of the more difficult to preach a sermon. Yeah. It's one of the more difficult. You know, you wouldn't just go pre- pick that one to go preach somewhere because it's really harsh. And remember, it's the one where Peter yeah. is going after the false teachers. It's not harsh. It just seems that way if you just take it right out of the other, the, his first letter and That's without right. the first chapter. Because you got to remember the context of that. It, this was basically his dying words. I mean, he knows he's about to go. And so he's giving them one last big charge. So, anyway, so I, I felt like I kind of walked that razor's edge of trying to deal with it contextually and what Peter was dealing with and why he wrote it, but then also bringing in our, you know, 2,000 years later, our cultural picture of where we are. So I felt good about it. It, it was a, you know, you're dependent on the Holy Spirit. The way I approach preaching is the Holy Spirit has a message to deliver. He's using a very cracked vessel, according to, you know, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4, to deliver that message. So you just want to stay out of the way and hopefully get what God wants out but of it. But you want to put your study in also. Exactly. So because it oh, took yeah. me a week to wrestle with that thing to, to get it where it wanted to go. But I felt good about it. I, I felt like it was it accomplished what I had hoped it would uh, with God's help to be able to deliver that, to both be relevant, but also be fair to what. Peter was trying to say. Yeah, every time I get in front of a little group, which is every Sunday morning in the little building next to the main building, all I do is build everything against Matthew. It starts in chapter 16. He's been doing these miracles he, and dealing with all of the issues of the human race. In the middle of Matthew, he, he, he goes, the first half is to make sure they, they know try to get him to understand who he is. Well, then he starts on what he's fixing to do. And uh, so Matthew says, Jesus said, I'm going up to must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders. Chief priest, you said, didn't work out well, all these arguments. Teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and after three days be raised from the dead. That's Matthew. Mark says the same thing in the middle of Mark. In the middle of Luke coming up on us, 
Uh, Jesus strictly warned them not to tell anybody, but the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders. He's saying this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, chief priests, teachers of the law. Everybody says, no, all have groups. He must be killed and on the third day be raised alive. So it finally gets to his purpose of being there, but he always waits halfway through Matthew, halfway through Mark, Luke, halfway mm-hmm. through John. And he, it, that's when he begins to say, here's the way this thing is going to come out. They were scratching their head, even the disciples, and no one really understood what he meant. Well, I have that on the board behind me when I start 2,000 some odd years later, and I'm just making sure they get that second part of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This right. is the purpose of him coming. He's going to remove your sin, and he'll raise you from the dead, and you better get on to it. Go go, yeah. go preach that, and you baptize people. Well, that's the message you're drawn to. So I had an interesting thing last night happen, and I probably shouldn't share this, so I think I will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I and could when you be look, wrong, <laughs> but, but I doubt. But I, I doubt could it. be wrong on this, <laughs> but I doubt it. So, you know, we're in the when you see a wedding, especially in your family. This is a it's it's a it's about a three day venture. Yeah, because all the families come in. The new family that's being married in our family, they're all in. The women get and, more excited than the men. Yeah, so there's like, and we have the start of camp, which is, you know, all close to our hearts because we all went to the local camp there that now Willie's son uh, runs. So my daughter, she's involved in that heavily. So about. So she's going to be a counselor out there this summer. Oh, she is. And so uh, she came in. So she's in because she's off from college, you know, in Nashville. And, uh. So she said, uh, do you care if we have worship night before the start of camp at our house? And I was like, "I'm I, if the, when you said worship at our house, you don't have to ask me that. I mean, you can just walk in. So this was two or three nights ago. Well, I was assuming six or seven people. It's a big staff. Yeah. So I, there was a light. <laughs> I, I already had thought there's a lot of girls going to be coming through there. There was a light knock on the door. And when I opened it, because Missy was like, oh, sure. But she wasn't even there when they showed up. And uh, so I just hollered from the couch. Come on in. Don't knock. <laughs> Come in. You know, because if somebody's knocking on my door, I'm nervous. So they came in. Well, it was about 40 of them. 40. And so they sang, prayed, and preached for about two and a half hours, which was the backdrop for me to work on the wedding, which was awesome. It felt like I was in like a little cubicle in heaven. So you were working on your wedding while all that was going on around you. Yeah, it was awesome. Kind of took you back to the school of preaching days. Yeah, and Missy came in at some point, you know, and of course she's got right in the middle of it, providing harmony. It was really a special night. So fast forward a couple nights later, because so so the whole neighborhood has all these new people in, because now we're, we're still on the wedding and you have that. So last night, uh, after the rehearsal dinner, we had the rehearsal and the rehearsal dinner. Well, there was a knock on the door, and it's late. It's almost ten o'clock. So I looked out there, but and I saw a person, big guy, huge. I didn't recognize, but I figured it's either from the family that's coming in, or it's part of this camp crew. Because there's people staying all over the neighborhood. So Reed opened the door, and uh, it was kind of an awkward pause. Of course, the guy sees me sitting on the couch, and he said, hey, Jace. And I said, hey. Of course, I'm studying for the podcast. Yep. I got my Bible open. There's some notebooks. And so I was kind of listening to the conversation, and, Reed didn't say, come on in, but he was like, what? What can we do for you? (laughs) (laughs) It was like Dad did that that time to Willie. Can I help you? (laughs) He said, well, I'm a big fan of uh, the Robertsons. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh. And a big fan of the podcast. And so Reed said, yeah. And he said, so I I drove from California to Uh to try to try to meet y'all. And so then it was an awkward silence because then I looked up at the 
o'clock. I was like, good grief, it's about 10 o'clock at night, you know? And I said, well, hey, I'm studying for the podcast. And he was just looking at <laughs> Because I was thinking, well, what what drew you here was not me. It's what you're hearing on the podcast, to your point, right. you know. And he's like, well, I, you know, can I ask you for a picture? And usually I don't if they show up at my house because I'm like, there's a line you cross. And I'm saying this, uh, don't don't show up at my house at 945. <laughs> I don't care where you, where you drove. Because yeah. it kind of hit me on that. It's like people who say the reason they're having a bad attitude is because they got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, well, what's that got to do with anything? Sleep later and be nicer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just because you drove a large distance doesn't mean that was a wise decision, <laughs> so, you know? So anyway, I took the picture, but I, I just want to say, look, you're drawn to the truth that is revealed, which is Jesus, and that's great. We're happy about that, but don't drive at my house for a picture because yeah. the gate was open. We have a gate. Because all the people. It was open because we're having a, a rehearsal you know, for the for the wedding. So it was the perfect storm. Which I'll add this since Jace went here. I've said this before. Anybody in our podcast audience, you are always welcome to 3201 North 7th Street, West Monroe, yeah. which is our church, on Sundays. Dad teaches an unashamed Bible class. Sometimes I preach there. Sometimes Jace does. And size usually there. So you're welcome to come there, worship with us, meet us, but please do not come to our homes just because you don't know. We also have some kooky, crazy people that show up at your house with not good intention, and we don't know the difference. And so that's just a... Yeah, you know, so I thought, that's why I said, maybe I shouldn't share that, but I think I will. <laughs> and I think that's good. <laughs> and look, we, we know people get swept up, but Jay's makes a great point. You're, you're being drawn to the gospel. It's not... We're just, we're just vessels who... Put yeah, this out I, I think yourself. that's a. I think it's a great point that needs to be talked about. I I, I noticed the other day on um, one of the message boards, uh, I, I was reading some of our audience interacting, and it was it was gotten to this argument about you know I, well I, I like this person more. I, I meaning different ones of us on the podcast, and they need to talk. Well, I, need follow to talk I follow Zach. I follow Jace. It, I, I just, I was thinking, I mean, I really thought of that verse. I just turned to it in First Corinthians 3. Yeah, for, for when one says, I, I'm of Paul, and another, I'm of Apollos, and are, are you not mere men? And I, I just think about, like, like yeah, it's, I mean, this thing about don't put your hope in people. Don't put your hope in any of us. I can tell you right now, because, I, I mean, I know yeah, all we'll, three of your flaws, and we'll, we all know each other's flaws. Yeah. We we will let you down, we'll and, and, and I think that. I tell you, I think it's, man, I do I think that's key, man. It's like we're like if if what we're doing is not pointing people to Christ, I mean, then what are we doing, right? I mean, and I know we are for a lot of people, but I mean, yeah, this there's nothing special about nobody, none of us, you know, um, particularly you guys because y'all more kind of had that fame from Duck Dynasty, but I mean, it's just people. You know and that's what, I mean? what I'm people. saying, and because uh, I was going to say, you know, and for what a picture. The picture we're trying to present is the image of the invisible God, which is Jesus. So that is the picture yeah. that you should receive, which is why, because he, I could tell he wanted to come in and hang out. And I said, no, I'm studying for the podcast. The picture you need to be concerned about is the image of the invisible God. Yeah. And don't, it, don't come back here. And there's still, there's still a social boundary of people. When people come to your home, they need to be, and pretty much invited there to be able to come in. So that's that's well, exactly. we need to live that by that. Let's let's take a break. So we have Father's Day coming up, uh, which Dad will give you a or now that you're listening, you can hear us. We'll give you an early Happy Father's Day. Yeah, for being our dad. That work wonders. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> one of the things you said, what what can I get? You know, from my dad for Father's Day. So one of our sponsors. Has a great product, and uh, we've actually gotten this for our dad, and it's Tommy John underwear. Because, you know, sometimes your dad may be still holding on to the old tidy whitey days, and so we want to bring them into the 21st century. Uh, Tommy John's keep you cool. They have a breathable, lightweight fabric, four times the stretch of competing brands, and they've sold over 20 million pairs, so obviously people love them. I've been a huge Tommy John fan long before they were sponsors of our podcast. Great pair of underwear. So once you check them out, um, they have the best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free, guarantee. 
So they stand behind their product, which we love. Shop TommyJohn.com slash Phil for Father's Day and get 20% off your first order. So it's a great way to save money and honor your dad. Save 20% for dad right now at TommyJohn.com slash Phil. That's TommyJohn.com slash Phil. See their site for details. So and it even that this whole concept kind of goes in with what I talked about in my sermon. Jay, my, the ser- my sermon title is actually what he thought about this was liars, lords, and lustful losers. What well, sounds real warm and fuzzy, Al? <laughs> that <laughs> that was the name of it. Wow! And so when I read that and went through Ooh. it, I was like, I'm gonna tell you, this was a rough one, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel okay. because in all of those situations, there was always a righteous remnant. There was Lot, there was Noah, there was the good angels, and so at the end of it, we turned it back up. But it was, it was not exactly the text you would choose to preach. Hey, it you know you appreciate what heaven is all about understanding that the alternative is something you just don't want to be a part of. Right. And and my ultimate point was that Peter was warning him about people that are that you follow. You want to make sure that they're in line with what Jesus is doing. And he ran up on some people in the first century that had bad mojo in their what they were trying to accomplish. And that's the same with us. We expect, we're glad you guys follow us, but look, we got to stick to the word of God and what he's leading us. Well, exactly. And we kind of talked about some controversial things in the last podcast on the bonus time. And uh, so, but really it's about, if you say, where are you at in Luke? I mean, he calls these men, they leave everything. And he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then Luke kind of records the instances of, of the specific people that Jesus was calling. And how you dubbed them the untouchables, which I thought was clever. Yep. Because you got a guy with le- le- leprosy or some sort of skin disease that was a social outcast. There's a paralytic that not only do are they overlooked, but people don't feel comfortable around people like that because it makes them feel bad we we just don't want to go to that part of our society because it's sad we don't know what to say we don't know why this happened and we just don't want to deal with it right and uh it, it's it's hard to be in that world of course being a celebrity has brought us all into this that type of world we've all had you know prayers with kids with cancer and uh you know willie and i was at the request of a, of a dying kid one time we're on a, a video with the kid as he was dying. I mean, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to be a part of in my life. I mean, it's a little kid, it's, yeah. you know, it's not his fault. He's dying. And he's like, I want to, my last request, I want to talk to <laughs> Willie and Chase. So, and we did it because we were trying to offer him encouragement and peace in, in this, terrible situation. Well, in the end of my sermon, Jace, I told a story that had happened the night before when we were leaving the stage and there were a lot of people that kind of came over and wanted to see us. And so we're talking with people and trying to take a few pictures on our way out the door because we got to get on a plane, fly back home. Dad had to teach and had to have a wreck. As it turns out, I had to preach the next morning, but a young man comes up to me. He looked like he was a, I don't know, 16, 17, 18 year old young man. And he's just crying. And he said, because I, I had shared some of my story in our Q&A that we did, and he said, I'm right where you were, and I need to talk to my dad, and I need to get this thing right. And so I just stopped. You know, I mean, people are coming up, and I just said, hey, hang on just a minute. Let me talk to this young man. And so we had a conversation about what it means to come back to God because he was had been a prodigal son. And so, and then I prayed with him. And, and so I just thought, you know, he was moved by the message and by me willing to share what God had done in me. And so that's why we went there. And so that's the reason we do what we do is because God has brought us to rescue and redemption in him. All right. So that's why we do this. So Well, I was going to say this. I mean, I, th- I think if you, if you say, man, what would really excite you? I think what it would excite all of us if somebody came up and talked about how how much how great God is and how much God has changed their life and Correct. how much and, and for me uh, the biggest compliment is 
is, man, I started listening to your podcast and I, I never knew Jesus in the way that I know him now because because of what you guys are doing. That's a different type of compliment than you guys are great. You know, I mean, what yeah. we want to do is I want to see him glorified and magnified by what we're doing. I mean, that's what that's what matters. That's why we do what we do. And it's those moments like you encountered right there, Al, that are that's real. That's those are real. Yeah, genuine, another guy, and, an, another guy told me at the event, God saved me because I began to listen to what you were telling me from His Word. He took another guy told me that at that event we were at, and he's right. It wasn't us that saved him. God saved him no, through us it's talking. His Word. That's right. Yeah. Well, my point was the third leg of the untouchable is where it's kind of a record scratch moment here. Because really, most people would say, "Oh, isn't that awesome? Jesus, He touched the untouched, you know, the guy with the skin disease." And ever when everybody's panicking and contagion is running rampant, you know, here's Jesus showing who God is that He's healer and and accepting of all people, and even the guy, the paralytic. But in that he moment, gets up and takes his mat and he takes his skips mat, out of the door. What but he in each. Of those four, we even get to the third one, the record scratch. He's, he's, there's, you know, he's telling the leper to be clean, but there's a spiritual connotation to that, that this Jesus can clean you. Yep. Even not from the outside. He's making a point. Yeah, I'm going to clean the outside, but I can clean you from the inside. And he, he, that is what sparks the controversy when he does that. Cause the paralytic, he says, your sins are forgiven. And it's like, what? And so he was only doing that to show the greater power is that this is God because only God can forgive sins. Well, then he calls the tax collector, you know, Levi or Matthew. I mean, he's called Levi here. And then they have a party, a bank. I mean, they call it a banquet. It was a party yep. for Jesus. And there were large crowds of other tax collectors. We can all agree we don't like them by general rule. That's right. So all of a sudden, this is not warm and fuzzy anymore. I can see healing a guy with a disease. I can see... But you know why? one of the big reasons why, Jace, is because from a Pharisee's perspective, he looks at those other two and says, well, they couldn't help the situation they were in, but he helped them. Now we got these guys here. They've chosen to do what yeah, they've been life's doing. Life's choices. Life's and, and not only tax collectors, but sinners. The hurdles are numerous, but he's, he's getting a lot of flack on the way to tell them. By the way, he began to say, we're going up to Jerusalem. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, the most religious people, the people that are causing us trouble and saying, what in the world is that? You know, do he healing this one, that one on the Sabbath, all these arguments. Jesus was giving them how this is going to be. Once he started down the road of we're going up to Jerusalem, the most religious people on the earth are going to turn me over to the Gentiles and I'm going to die, be buried in three days, I'll be raised from the dead. Once he starts down that trail, things get worse, not better. They begin to get a get a like a monster is raised its head. Oh, you're right. We're in We're the getting early rid of him. We're in the early stages. All right. Oh, right. You, that's so, why he hadn't mentioned that yet because no, he's laying right. a groundwork. But he does there. say, "I've not come to call righteous." In verse thirty-two, to come call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Yep. So if everyone one was honest, everyone that's old enough to understand right and wrong, you become a sinner. You see, they got factions, and he's saying, well, the I'm going to die that, for yeah. every one of y'all because you're all sinners, and you need to get that in your head on quit bad-mouthing your neighbor, and and I'm going to teach you how to love him. And it, it was just, they said, we're going to get rid of him. I mean, they, they rallied together under the auspices of the evil one. And, I mean, that was... Well, right. about a rough road to hoe. So what happened was, I mean, God gives the law to the Jews. And and you're going to see this, uh, you know, come out in Luke 6, which is Luke's shorter version of the Sermon on the Mount. Right. Yep. But from their perspective, God gave the law so that they could keep a lot of it and then earn God's blessing. 
Yep. And Jesus is turning that on its head, from, and he starts with the people first. In that everybody's that, that doing he, it, uh, uh, Jace, but but sin is is starting. <laughs> well, the problem is they're like, uh, you know, Jesus is calling people that that doesn't seem to uh, fit their legal approach to how how God is, which right. most religions say the the more good you do, the more in favor you are with God. And Jesus is coming and turning that on its head, basically saying, I'm providing the way out. I'm providing. If and I'm the only sinless one here. Yeah. And because of that, you try to do what's right. It's not the other way around, and which is what separates Jesus from everybody else. You're never going to attain it all. You're never going to be good enough, no matter how much of it you can. That keep. is correct. You got all these verses. If you if you break one point, you're guilty of all of it. So he's putting everybody on the same plane. Yeah. And That's why he said, I came to call. My point is, sinners. he hasn't told them how, except he's getting close to yeah. how all this is going to work. Because right now they're looking at him and he's going to come back and finally say, I'm going to die for the sins of the world and I'll raise him from the dead. And now you're on ground where he said, he do what? I mean, they're like, what in the world? Is that the one that's going down there and said, be good to lepers? And is that the same one that said, love all your neighbor, no matter how much sins he's committed? And Well, that's where I was getting to. And we'll get to Luke 6. I mean, I'm just trying to prepare everybody. It gets worse. <laughs> So uh, we love all of our sponsors of Unashamed. Uh, they make this podcast possible. Um, we live in a world of capitalism, uh, so they are the reasons we're able to do this podcast, so we love these guys. And then some companies come along and they just have a sort of closer sync, I guess, with your mindset and philosophy. And I feel that way about Barrel Buddy. When Zach and I first talked to these guys, uh, you could tell. I mean, one is that they came up with a product, a hunting product, uh, in our case, because they were out hunting in a field and realized they needed a better way to clean their weapon and clean their barrel. And so they came up with something, which we love. That's what we did with duck calls. And then also we found out these guys are believers. And actually, I have a back and forth with one of their one of their owners uh, of a Bible study and devotion. And I just love that about these guys. So instantly we were impressed with them. Of course, we all hunt and uh, we're gun owners and we're, we're responsible. So we want to make sure that our guns are clean. And to do that, this is a great product. Uh, if you're watching here, I'm holding one in my hand. This is for nine millimeter, 357, 380. So any weapon that you have, whether it's a, a pistol uh, or a rifle or a shotgun, uh, they can make sure that barrel is clean uh, with their white polymers that that they use, you can see everything that comes out of your barrel. So check these guys out. Uh, we love them. They're a great company. Barrelbuddy.com, B-A-R-R-E-L buddy.com. That's barrelbuddy.com. Check them out. But he's going to get to Luke 6, where he starts talking about you should love your enemies. And, you know, we talked about that in the overtime because – you live in a world where people are not going to agree with you. And so you don't compromise truth. You don't compromise trying to convert people to Jesus because he's the one that changes your life, not yeah. us. But how you treat people, Jesus is really radical. Because I don't I mean. think anywhere else in any world situation or religious set situation are you supposed to love yeah. Your enemies. Yeah. And do good to them. And he continues. Can we'll we'll get into it. And you're what? like, wait, wait, what? So how you treat people matters to Jesus. So he, he brings that out, and the religious world, they don't like that. The no. people under the old law, they don't they don't like this. What do you think Paul thought, Jason, about him use and this was just an argument to them, but it was a brilliant argument Jesus uses. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I mean, he just makes a practical point. That's what doctors do. They help people who are hurting and they need healing. And that, that's, So what do you think Luke thought about that? I mean, here's Luke, who's a physician. Jesus said it, but he's looking at it like— Luke's eyes got big. Yeah, he's like, yes, that's what—I mean, because he, he spent his life in preparation to do just what Jesus said on the physical side. But what he's saying is, 
I'm a spiritual healer and a physical healer in his case, because he could literally bring that, but that wasn't his purpose. But I couldn't help but think about that one to mention that, that here was Luke, who was a physician, and Jesus uses his profession to illustrate that's why he came, is to help people find healing, which I thought yep. was interesting. But what's interesting about it is the underlying implication of what Jesus said, which is that everyone is sick. That's Everyone's right. a sinner. That's, That's right. the beef. That's, right. That's the beef. You ask, where's the beef here? Well, because they're saying, yeah, but we're the righteous and you're hanging out with sinners. Yep. And that's really what it comes down to. Works won't do it. it. It won't do it. So thus comes our next phrase, because now they're trying to find ways, since he's representing himself as God, and they're representing themselves as law keepers, they're trying to turn him into a hypocrite because they're like, well, let's find where he breaks the law. If he breaks the law, well, he can't be from God because he's violating the law. So the first instance you see is verse 33. They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. So he, he, they don't really attack Jesus as much as his disciples. But this is also just the first time they do go directly to him with a complaint. Because, you know, the other two, they were just thinking it. Then the second one, they went to the disciples. This is the first time they ask him, and you're right, but there's a caveat. It's not really about him. It's about why don't your disciples, why don't they more like us, is what they ask. So Jesus gives them an answer that is, <laughs> they probably thought, what are you talking about? And he says, can you make the guest of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? So I'm, I'm pausing for on purpose. <laughs> Say what now? Can you make the, so they said, why do your, why do your disciples, why are they not fasting? Cause that's in the law. you you know, there's a time to fast. Of course he's, and when the next thing is, you know, about the Sabbath, how they're acting on the Sabbath. So he says, can you make the guest of the bridegroom fast while he's with them? But the time will time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them in those days. They will fast. Which is a little glimpse, Dad, to your point you've been making. That's a little glimpse on what was going to happen to him. He just kind of drops it as a hint here. That's correct. If you're new to the faith, Jesus is basically saying, and I mean, I'm fixed to do a wedding tonight. But if you go to Ephesians 5, and look, there's been more arguments about the roles of the husband and the role of the wife, especially, you know, in our current culture, right. about, because it's like, wives, submit to your husbands, you know, husbands love your wives. The point was that, it, Paul's point, is that we're married to Jesus. He says that at the end. He's like, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about the church in Christ. He, Jesus is the bridegroom. Yep. We're, we're married to Jesus. There's two vows you make. You're married to Jesus, and you, for us, you know, we marry our wife. Well, that, that thread helps each situation because it's when you start thinking about it. So when you come to Christ, well, that's just the beginning. It's not over. You start this journey with Jesus. Well, when you say, I take this woman, you know, as sickness and in health till death does it, does, uh, what, what is the old? It's like saying, death do us part. Do us it's part. like I accept Jesus for removing my sin. Right. And in both cases, you're going to need the grace of God to function. Yep. And. I mean, that was Paul's point in Ephesians 5. So here he's referencing that. I mean, there's a reason Jesus never married. This is it. He's married to us, all of us. I mean, that, that's, that was his idea, and I think it's fantastic. So then he tells them this parable. No one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one. If he does, he will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No. New wine must be poured into new wineskins, and no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for he says the old is better. Now, number one, the fact that he's using wine as an illustration probably sent a lot of them to pass out. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the second one is he's, what, what's his point? How would you describe, so they ask him a question. How come your disciples don't fast? Because they're not keeping the law. They're being hypocrite. That was their implication. Right. And Jesus says, I need to be more like us. Because they're what. with me and I'm the bridegroom and you don't take new wine and pour it into old wineskins. So that was his answer. So what, let's say you. So, yeah, there's three different, there's actually three different illustrations. Because the first one he deals with is the, the idea of the wedding. It's the picture he gives, as you described. The second one is this concept of who would take a new garment and, and basically ruin it to fix an old garment. That's, that's what is. I'm done with duck hunting clothes, but I didn't go that this far. Well, because well, uh, you didn't care if it yeah. stayed in one piece. But no, no, Dad, actually, your illustration makes his point. So to you, the old garment that you have, and, and I'm thinking about that shirt you donated to oh, the yeah. museum, that meant more to you than anything new that came in, right? Because right. you love that shirt. It, it was you, it was comfortable on you. That's really becomes the point is because he's saying you're comfortable with the old, but I'm telling you we're bringing in something new. So that's his point. But the Pharisees were much more comfortable with the old. That's the point he's trying to make. Well, and they don't like his the people he's running with. Right. And the way he's doing it and what he's claiming. Yeah, I think you can see their hesitation in something new because everything he's doing it's, it's not just it's not that it's just something new. It's that it's a completely different like paradigm shift. It's a it, they they don't have room for it to even like the capacity of the That's wine right. skin. That's right. It, it's their wine skin can't even hold it. And I think that's the the point here. It, it reminds me of a a C.S. Lewis quote and a, a story that, about Phil that I've told in a, a lot of sermons, and it always resonates with people. That uh, Phil, I don't know if you remember, we went to South Carolina for something, and we were staying at this hotel, like this resort on like on the on the coast on the Atlantic Ocean, and I asked Phil if he wanted to go and look at the ocean, and he was like, "Nah." He's just like, nah, and I don't want to do that. I was like, but you've never been to the ocean. Don't, don't you want to see it? He's like, nah, I don't want to see it. And uh, I said, well, you want to go get something to eat? He said, yeah, let's get something to eat. It just so happened to be the restaurant was on top of like the sand dune area, like had like a restaurant up there. So you had to <laughs> go up the boardwalk. You had to see the ocean if you want to eat at the restaurant. So we're walking up there and we're just talking and no big deal. But as soon as we hit that that crest where you see the ocean, I remember Phil stopped in his tracks and just like he, 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 when he saw it, he's like, whoa. And it was like this moment of like, man, I, I didn't realize what was there. And yeah, I think it, it reminded me of that C.S. Lewis quote where he says that we're half hearted creatures. And it's not that the Lord finds our desires too, too strong. He finds them too weak. We are half hearted creatures who go about fooling with sex and drink. He said it because it's it's like settling for a mud pie in the slum because you can't fathom a holiday by the sea. So I think when you get down here to this wine story, I think it's what, that's what it is. But the but new wine must be put in the fresh wineskins, and no one can after drinking old wine wish for new. For he says the old is good enough. It's all he knows. All he knows is the old wine. That's he right. can't even fathom something so beautiful, something so grand something so amazing and so what jesus is bringing to jason's point it's not just like a new thing like a new version of an iphone yo it's like the old no it's a whole nother deal that they don't even have the imagination to comprehend or even think about and that's why i think it was so difficult for the pharisees because they were so latched on to their own power dynamic that they could not fathom the beauty that Christ was bringing in his kingdom. Exactly. Because that's the two underlying questions he's asking. I know it's three illustrations, but it's two questions. Where's the bride? Where's the bride? I mean, if somebody answered my question, how come your disciples are not fasting? Because that's a good thing to do. Well, he starts talking about, well, the bridegroom, they're not going to fast because the bridegroom is here. Well, I'd be thinking, well, where's the bride? (laughs) Which is the why he's reaching out to these people. 
It's like, I'm going to make you fishers of men. These are going to be the bride of the bridegroom. The bridegroom's here, so we're not fasting. They're like, well, who's the bridegroom and where's the bride? Well, that would have been two questions to ask. Of course, they, they weren't asking that question. Because if they would have, they'd have put their faith and trust in the guy standing right in front of them. He's saying, I am, here's another I am moment. I am the bridegroom. And look, more than likely, since we're kind of early in Luke's, you know, depiction here, Nicodemus, who we read about in John, was probably one of those Pharisees that was there listening, whose heart was touched, and he would become part of the bride. Yeah. Which makes it pretty amazing when you think. And the second question they should ask is, well, let's, where's this new wine? What, what new wine do you <laughs> yeah. speak of? That's right. That would have been a good question. Those two questions would have been very useful for them to understand that Jesus, what he was trying to say. Yeah. But instead of, they go in a different direction and, and keep that's this a, That's narrative. a great point, Jace. That's a great point because look at their response on all of the things that Jesus said. It was never to be inquisitive of more. It was always just instantly you know, deny it and say that it's not real. You know, it wasn't like, Hey, well, yeah, explain to me how you can be the one to forgive sins. Like they didn't ask that. They were just like, no, nah, he, he's, this is blasphemy. Never. They never were curious about what he was saying at all. And I think that's the difference between a Pharisee. Say, are you a, do I have a Pharisee's mind or do I have the mind of a seeker um, of the heart that God wants? A Pharisee is not curious. He's already got it figured out. He's got everything tidied up in his little box, and he has all the answers already that he can control and that that uh, that he can contain. And I think that's what God is bringing here through Jesus. He said, no, you can't contain it. You can't control it. You come seeking. You come with a curiosity. You come with a humility that says, maybe, maybe I don't have all the answers. God, what do you have for me? I, they, they never ask those kind of questions, ever. Well, that's why we brought up in the overtime last time about how we treat people and how we're persecuted, which he's going to get into Luke 6. He's like, you will be, you are going to be persecuted in my name. And, uh, the, you know, the reason we brought that up is because he's giving you a picture of who the people are that he's calling. And you quickly figure out that he's calling everybody. Jew, Gentile, the sick, the lame, you know, the the tax collectors, and uh, that that's all he's doing, and, and he's going to be the bridegroom of everybody. So like the Pharisees and, and the, some of the controversies that are not controversies, it's just people looking at how people operate and trying to find something wrong. So if you claim to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, there are other people that are always going to have this pharisaical mindset of, well, you're doing wrong. And so we brought up the, the fact that, you know, somebody had a picture of somebody working on the crew of the chosen. So we're going not in the management, not in the, the picture. There's somebody working on equipment back there in the back. And I've been on the set. There's a large crew. You can come to my set on our TV uh, show and there are, I'm positive, even though I don't know half the people on the crew, I'm positive there are people who do not love Jesus working on our crew. Sure. <laughs> so if you were going to make an assumption that because I'm working with them, somehow or another, I'm mischaracterizing Jesus, that would be a wrong assessment. Or, so, or that have different political views. I mean, Fox is the one that... The, is the platform for your show. I'm sure there are people working on your show that don't wouldn't align with the views of their network, but you know what? It's America. It's okay. Exactly. But well, so yeah. it just seems how these things morph that, you know, somebody sees somebody, you know, wearing a rainbow flag. So they're assuming that, you know, I'm in supportive. I'm in, I support whatever narrative the world says. And uh, my response to that was, you know, God invented the rainbow. I'm not sure I'm ready. I wish we could take it back because, like, no, I, we had it I, first. I never let it go. Uh, <laughs> you know, so to make assumptions, you know, because I see a rainbow, uh, that, that's on you. So the point is how you treat people, and Jesus is trying to share that with the religious people of the day, and they're having trouble with that. He's talking about loving your enemies. He's talking about reaching out to tax collectors and so, you know, I, I tell you this, you don't have to be a believer, uh, 
you know, to work on the crew of my show. I mean, number one is I have no control who the production company hires. And so you say, what do you do? I love, I love these people. I love them. And I show Jesus to them and, and I befriend them. And, uh, even, you know, something I learned as a teenager and this was kind of awkward. And I've told y'all, uh, you know, the way my life went, you know, I've never been drunk a day of my life. And I, and I, owe, you know, uh, I'm thankful because I saw how Phil led his life. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to leave that part out of my life. And, and so, me. Yeah. Uh, and yeah you I saw, saw you go life. off yeah. the deep end. I was like, no, I think I'll pass on that. So what, what threw me for a loop is as a 18 year old Christian, I've been in the Lord three or four years and the pastor of our church, the lead pastor, uh, who actually did our wedding, Ray Melton, he invited me one night to go to, essentially a bar. And I thought, this guy's crazy. He's, I said, well, you're the preacher. And he said, yeah. And uh, it was called a, you know, a pool hall, a pool hall. And he's like, no, what I do, I, I go, I, I take brothers up there and we go play pool and we, we show them Jesus in our community. And I was like, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> but the more I thought about it and he used this, instance in luke 5 yep. he said you know jesus had a bad reputation for hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners he said i never go alone so i always have brothers with me and uh so and we did and we didn't drink we played pool but i met people and uh you and know, some I, of those people were led to christ oh, a lot of people because i continued that ministry after he moved back to west texas <laughs> you know and uh so i just thought if somebody drove by though this is what the picture of this is. Certain people would yeah. drive by and, and you could make arguments on why you shouldn't be there. And some of them would be legitimate. You know, if, if, a, if an alcoholic, a self-proclaimed alcoholic is in there, I would have a different conversation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe you shouldn't, shouldn't be there. participate in this ministry, you know. But me and, uh, me and Mr. Ray, it was awesome. And uh, so I, I even took it further because one of the guys that was converted during that time period was one of the greatest pool players in the state of Louisiana. And so I came up with an idea. I said, here's what we'll do. Cause this guy was making a living hustling people out of their money, playing pool. And I said, that's over. And he's like, what? I can't do that. I was like, you could, but I got a better idea. What we're going to do is we're going to challenge people to play. And if you lose, we'll pay them $20. So the pressure's on, but if you win, we're going to say they need to have, have to a, have a Bible study. Have to have a Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> I said, so we, and he's like, well, where, how do I win there? I was like, this ain't about you. This is about God winning. <laughs> you're, you're now contributing. No, I said, you are now playing pool for the Lord God almighty. <laughs> Don't screw this up. <laughs> so look, we Maybe are, that's why he was the world's best. <laughs> well, look, so the first the first guy we do this to, there's a guy over there playing by himself, you know, and we start talking and, uh, you know, he thinks he's good. And, you know, my guy's just over there. He's got, he's got one of these pool sticks in a case, you know, oh, yeah. Where you, That's yeah. when you know, he's sitting over there and I said, how about Dylan gunfighter? <laughs> so he's watching me play. Look, and I'm terrible. This is think the sting here. So he's watching me play. And I was like, look, you want to play? And he said, I'll play. I said, what do you want to play for? And he said, uh, you know, how about $10? I was like, how about 20 Well, he's already seen me play. He said, oh, I'll do 20 So I take my $20, and so he goes to get his, because that's what you do. You know, you both put your $20 on the table. And I said, look, I don't want your money. You, you don't have to bring up 20 Well, then he was kind of confused. Like, so I'm going to get you to play my friend. And if you beat him, you can take my $20. I said, but if he wins, I said, we want to share something with you. And I will say at this point, Jace, because we were both interns together when this was all going on, $20 was a lot of money. <laughs> $20 was a lot of money. <laughs> it ain't I, like it today. It's like. <laughs> he said, so I can't lose. I was like, no, you have to put up no money. He said, well, what's the catch? I was like, the catch is we're going to share a story from the Bible if you lose. And he's like, well, how long is that going to take? I said, how long do you want it to take? <laughs> He said, how about 10 minutes? I said, great. I can do it in 10 minutes. And he said, well, I'm not going to have to worry about it. And I said, 
Okay. All right. Fine. <laughs> so my buddy over there, well, he's nervous because now he's like, I mean, this guy's spiritual <laughs> <laughs> destiny. <laughs> if I, I kid you not, my buddy broke. We're playing nine ball. Ran the table. This old boy over here never shot. He never picked up his stick because we played two out of three. The second he broke and ran out. And I said, well, it looks like you lost. <laughs> he could have let the stick you mean he in never the fired a shot. He never <laughs> shot. And and my buddy. Right now he's uh, thinking this is on the border of being miraculous. I thought I was Well, Kevin, well Kevin, my buddy, who I want to give him credit, uh, he, he, was, he was a new Christian, uh, Kevin McIntosh. He said, you know. I think the spirit of the Lord must have been with me. I said, oh, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> and uh, so we wound up sharing with this guy, and he was our first hustle convert. <laughs> so a bit. actually, I shared Jesus with him in the parking lot, and he was, he was actually drinking a beer while, while I'm sharing Jesus with him. Because you didn't say any ground rules about that. You just said 10 minutes. Well, I, I'm not, you know, but if somebody would have driven by, what is the picture they're seeing here? They would have said, look at Jace. Yeah, he, I mean, boy. He, he oh, yeah. eats and drinks with you pool know, players. This and, is what I'm getting, and I'm taking yeah. up for the guys of the Chosen for this said reason. You know what I mean? And so when his, his response was, after 10 minutes, I said, because I said 10 minutes, time. I said, what do you think? And he took that beer and he slung it across the road. I mean, the suds were flying out, you know, which now I know what people who are looking at this. Now they're thinking, what? Well, he's littering. You see what I mean? It, it's always going to be something negative. Yeah. But <laughs> he's not my, worthy of eternal life. I took that as a really good sign, though, uh, good for, for the study. And uh, eventually he came around. And uh, that's the fellow that I've told the story about before. We uh, we wind up baptizing him a couple nights later. And the next day, because I didn't know there was a warrant out for his arrest, you know, they took him. He was in prison <laughs> three years. And the day he got out, which was Christmas Day, he knocked on my door. And I was like, well, where have you been? He said, I've been in prison. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been studying my Bible while I was there. He did some follow-up. So anyway, I know that was a long story, but I'm just trying to get you to see, are you the are you are you finger pointing trying, you know, to see who's legit or are you living like Jesus? And all I'm saying is, yes, there there are things you can do that may seem like not the best idea, but you know, I, I'm getting these ideas, and Ray Melton, who who taught me that, he, he got this from watching Jesus and, and who he's trying to bring in. So uh, we're out of time. We'll uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in our overtime segment, blazetv.com slash unashamed, because Jay's eats with pool hustlers and sinners. So we'll yeah. talk a little more, more about that in the overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.